So let's start at the beginning. You were there 15th of July in Istanbul, 2016. How did you experience what happened that night? On July 15, 2016, I was in Istanbul in an island an hour from, uh, from Istanbul called Büyükada, which is a beautiful island, and a beautiful hotel. I was running a conference on Iran and its neighbors. I had a grant from, at the institution I was at the time at the Wilson Center, and I decided to do it in Istanbul because instead of bringing the, all the Middle Easterners to Washington, it would be nicer to do it in Istanbul. I had this beautiful location for it. And um, so the, the conference was starting Friday night. I was at the hotel, at Splendid Hotel, and welcoming people, and we had a dinner. And then after dinner, we started hearing stuff. But then I started getting phone calls from the BBC, CNN, saying there's a coup going on in Istanbul. What do you think? What are you saying? I said, I have no idea. I'm an hour away from Istanbul. And I really found out about the coup from the BBC and, and CNN. So we were not really aware. And then what happened was that the coup fizzled. The next morning, we, I, I assessed the situation and I decided that there was the coup was non-existent and I had brought all these people at a huge expense to Istanbul. So we did our conference Saturday and Sunday. We just finished our conference. We did our, our meetings and that was it. That was really my experience of the coup. It really was not an experience. And the, the irony, of course, is that I lived through many coups in, Istanbul, in Turkey. 1960, 1971, 1980, but um, this was unique. In what way? This, this, is a, this is not a coup in the sense that, I've, as I said, I've seen coups in Turkey. This is a coup that took place at 9 p.m. on a Friday night when Units tried to cross the bridge at the peak rush hour in Istanbul. Anybody who knows Istanbul knows that it takes you hours to get through the, the bridge. This is not the way you do a coup. So we all knew that this was a little bit fishy from the beginning in the sense that there were very few units that participated. At the end, we did find out that only, only 9,000 soldiers were mobilized for this in a huge army. Um, and so this was not real. It, it turns out there may have been other, uh, other factors in the coup in the sense that the coup may have been discovered by the, by the government and they took countermeasures. But at that, that night, it looked very suspicious because you don't do a coup at 9 p.m. You don't do a coup with so few um, soldiers. And you don't try to take the bridge, you try to take the critical locations, the presidential palace, the major nodes of communication, uh, major ministries, none of that happened. Um, now we are more than two years after. Uh, what do you think about it now? Two years after the coup, I think this was a non-coup. I don't exactly know what happened, and it will take a very long time for researchers and others to find out because I think the government has, in Turkey, has completely hushed everything. They've created their own narrative. You can't question that narrative, but it's very clear that there were some very suspicious things happening. My hypothesis is that, yes, there was a coup in the making, the government discovered it. I don't know whether it's 24 hours earlier or maybe a week earlier, and they took precautions. They convinced some of the generals to change their mind, um, and, but still allowed this 9,000 two soldiers and cadets to move so that they had something, and they used it. They used it to, cons to consolidate power in Turkey, and if you see what happened since the coup, and immediately, within a couple of days, um, 200 officers, generals I'm talking about, were kicked out of the military. Why 200 officers? 
if you had 200 officers, generals, I'm not talking about captains, etc. If you had 200 generals participating in a coup, there would have been a lot more than 9,000 soldiers on the streets of Istanbul. Right? There would have been tanks, uh, navy ships, aircraft moving. There are other things that are very bizarre. I mean, the parliament was bombed by F-16s. The F-16 is the most lethal aircraft that you can think of at the moment, right? the F-16, the F-15. And the, you look at the damage that was done by, by, to the parliament, it was minuscule, it's minor, it's a few offices that were somehow, and, and, and the roof, when you look at the pictures, it's something very bizarre. And Erdogan seemed also, he took a plane from, I think he was in Marmaris, he flew to Istanbul, he wasn't worried, he, in fact, he hovered around over Istanbul for a while. And if you have F-16s flying over, supposedly bombing, they could have taken you down. I mean, there, there are too many unanswered questions. It is quite possible that there was a cabal of some Gulenist officers, some Kemalists, some um, adventurous or people who wanted to maybe improve their position in the military, who thought of doing the coup. But that night, there wasn't. But it's very clear that Erdogan used it to rid himself from potential enemies, certainly, certainly in the military. And now you have a military that is very, very different from the military that Turkey had before. All the officers who were NATO trained, were seen as being pro-Western, were all kicked out. So now you have um, what everybody tells you is that you have officers who did not go through the regular NATO and other Western uh, alliance training, and they are the ones who are running, who are now in, in charge. And I think that's the first thing that I'd want. And of course, then he, he, he also cleansed the bureaucracy, he cleansed uh, civil society, he used that to, to rid himself of everybody and created essentially um, a one-person state. He also cleansed out all the officers working in NATO stations all over Europe and US uh, uh, and replaced them in a way with Eurasian officers. That's a total change in the structure of the military of, uh, of Turkey, isn't it? Look, the, the Turkish military has always been a little bit of a black box in that we know a lot of these officers because they've gone through military colleges, they've trained with uh, European officers, American officers, uh, but there has always been a certain esprit de corps within the military that has been, I think, not easily penetrated by, by, by the West, how these officers think. Turkey has also been changing under Erdogan. So you have, yes, you have NATO officers, but you also have nationalists, or some people call them Eurasianists, um, people who are kind of anti-Western. It's hard at this stage to tell. Um, we do, however, know that all the officers who were seen as being Western educated were kicked out, right? So what, what replaces them are people who are not necessarily exposed to the West. But what, to, what is it exactly that they think? I don't know. At this stage, I think they basically look at the political winds and, be, and follow those winds because everybody in Turkey is terrified, right? Um, I think the other interesting thing about this coup is that there were two narratives that came out out of this coup from Erdogan. Um, from Erdogan. One was, oh look, there are these evil, the Gulenists, they're trying to overthrow the regime and it's time to cleanse, to cleanse the country of the Gulenists and time to consolidate around one leader. But very subtly, there was also a very anti-Western, certainly anti-American message that came out of, um, uh, out of that, that, uh, that coup. Um, to this day, Erdogan and certainly all his, uh, his entourage and his press always accused the United States of being part of the coup. Why would the United States 
try to overthrow one, one of its allies. Has the United States done this in the past? You, know, you can argue yes, I mean, or supported coups in the past. But it's, it doesn't make sense at that juncture in Turkish-American relations, at the time when the Obama administration was getting ready to leave office. This is not what it is that they would be thinking. Plus, Turkey was far too important in terms of what was going on in the Middle East. Um, so, but, but Erdogan needed this anti-American um, narrative, if you want. And to the extent that they've accused me of being part of the coup, is helps them build that narrative. I, I mean, nobody, but I had worked in the US government, um, and I've written a lot uh, about Turkey. So by saying that because I was in Istanbul that night, that I had my fingerprints on the coup, that I somehow was all there. But that was a convenient way of, through me, attacking the Americans. Right. That was the whole purpose of, 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 that, of that story. So th what's interesting to me is the extent to which the West, especially the United States, doesn't understand this subtle anti-American message that has been conveyed since, and it has be become amplified over time. Yeah, he's repeating it. Uh, I mean, he said it right after the coup, and he's repeating it for the last couple of years, that America is part of the coup and behind the coup. I, I think it's not just the coup now. Turkey is going through a very difficult economic crisis on the eve of the municipal elections. And um, the inflation rate is high, unemployment is going up, uh, there's a recession in, in, in the making. And if you look at who it is that Erdogan and his press, and they, he controls all the whole press now, they're all pointing their fingers at the United States, directly or indirectly, saying, we are under attack. We have to fight for our survival. And we are under attack, not by the Russians, not by the Chinese, right? Not by our, uh, ISIS, but by the United States and the West. Right? And to me, what's interesting is that Washington doesn't understand or completely ignores this, this, this narrative instead of confronting it. I mean, why is that? Because I'm, I'm puzzled by that. Why, does Washington... why the weak reaction from, uh, from Washington and the US? Washington has always been, in my experience, very, very timid when it comes to the Turks. It's very interesting that when it comes to Turkey, the Washington bureaucracy, whether it's state or Pentagon, or even the White House, never wants to confront the Turks directly, whether it's on issues of human rights, whether it's on issues of the Middle East, whether it's issues of divergences between themselves. And, um, and they, they always think that Turkey is far too important to American interests, that you should not antagonize the Turks. And Turks have used this very, very well to their, to their advantage. I mean, yes, Turkey is important. I mean, just all, all by looking at the location of Turkey, I mean, it commands uh, territory. I mean, whether it's southwestern, southeastern Europe or the Middle East or, or Russia or the Caucasus, there is no, I cannot think of any, shall we say, real estate in the world that is as strategically located as Turkey. I mean, this was God's gift, if you want, to the Turks, that to put them of all places in this very strategic location. And as a result, the United States has always been very careful um, in, in its relations. Now, we are in the process of having a serious crisis with, with the Turks over the S-400 missiles that they're going to buy from from Russia. And the administration has made it very clear they don't want the, the Turks to buy the S-400s. The many generals in the Pentagon have said that they don't want F-35s, the best American aircraft that's coming off, to go to Turkey if, the Rus if they buy the Russian, because, uh, the Russian missile system because their, their planes will be compromised. Everybody thinks it's going to be a crisis. I'm starting to think that at the last minute they're going to find a solution. Again, because the Americans are worried about the Turks 
and they don't want to alienate the Turks. I would guess that CIA or any other intelligence service would have more information about what happened that night. But so far I have seen very, very little reactions or documents or, uh, or um, information coming out of the, of the Western intelligence uh, when it comes to what happened that night in Turkey. I don't think anybody really knows what happened that night in Turkey. I think even Western intelligence um, doesn't really understand what happened uh, that night. I don't get the feeling from being in Washington and having talked to lots of people that people in Washington had, had a good sense of what was going on. They were very surprised. They were really taken aback. Um, and even if intelligence agencies collect information after the fact and may have tried to reconstruct the events, you won't find out that. I mean, that's going to be very closely, closely held. Um, but I think this is a coup that is really um, a puzzle for everybody. And I think it will take f much longer to ultimately figure out what really happened behind it. Even the participation of the Gulenis to me is actually curious to some extent, because I don't think there were that many Gulenis officers at the high rank. I mean, there may have been ca captains, colonels, uh, majors, for sure. Uh, Gulen was trying to infiltrate or trying to put his own people everywhere. So why not the military? I mean, um, but the way the system works in Turkey, you go through so many steps bef uh, before you become a general. And they, that I, I would doubt very much that there were any high ranking generals like three stars, four stars that, that were Gulenis. Um, and look, let's face it, Gulen and Erdogan were allies. If Gulen was, you know, they made a deal, they made a, each made a pact with the devil. I mean, in the sense that Erdogan needed cadres that he didn't have when he became, came to power, so he brought in the Gulenis. And those two worked exceedingly well together. They had one common enemy, which was the military, right? It's only after 2007, when the military was politically defeated in Turkey, that you see fissures emerge between the Gulenis and, and, and not even immediately. After 2010, you see fissures emerge between the Gulenis and Erdogan, um, because after all, you are allies against the common enemy. The common enemy, the military is now weak, is not a factor anymore. You, they only left two powerful forces in Turkey, and at that point, nature, if you want, dictates that you're going to go after each other. Right? And you see after 2011, 12, 13, increasing tensions between, between the, the two. Um, so, but, but there were a lot of Gulenis in the bureaucracy, in the, in the police forces, in, in the judiciary system. Oh, absolutely. But they were brought in by Erdogan himself. Um, yeah, about that. Yeah, I mean, you are not, of course, um, the only one that is accused for being behind this coup. Uh, Fethullah Gulen is the, is the sort of main source of uh, uh, and accused for being the main leader of the, of the coup attempt. What do you think about that? Is Fethullah Gulen uh, the primary mover behind the coup? I find that very hard to believe. Only because, as I said earlier, I don't think there were very senior officers who were pro in the middle. And especially, especially when you look at the 200 officers who were kicked out immediately after the coup from the Turkish military, all these Western educated officers, all these who came out from NATO colleges, all those who were attaches in, 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 um, in NATO countries, those are the least likely officers who will be Gulenis. They don't like the Gulenis. I mean, the, the military has always been 
anti-religion, no matter where the, what the religious factor is, whether it is um, the Agbakan, Erdogan type, or Gülen type. They didn't, they, they've never liked that. As I said, I mean, did Gülen try to infiltrate the military? I, I don't know for a fact, but I'm sure yes. But I don't think they were capable of pulling a coup. And if they did, the fact that they failed is the best, um, right? that they really did not have the capability. But so that it tells me that um, there may have been some officers in there, but it was not uh, something that was organized in Pennsylvania and commanded by, you know, and, and Gulen wasn't sitting and pushing soldiers and, you know, over a map. and and try to, 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 to do this. But it was, again, a gift to Erdogan because that allowed him to really cleanse the bureaucracy, the police, the judiciary, or, and this way now he has his own people. And, and you see the results in many ways. The, the, the paradox, actually, is that in some ways the Gulenis, at least in the bureaucracy, and the reason Erdogan brought them in was because they were far more competent than the people that Erdogan had around him. And now that he has gotten rid of them, he's replacing them with people who are not maybe as good as the Gulenis. And we will see the results of that in, 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 in the bureaucracy. But, but, but um, the coup is a turning point in Turkey because it really consolidated Erdogan's power. You cannot say anything against the coup. You cannot question the coup. You cannot um, say, even ask the question of um, why did you jail all these cadets? Many of those soldiers on the bridge that night were cadets. They were not even proper soldiers. Right? So if your officer tells your cadets you have to march up the hill or you have to march to the, to the bridge, they will do it. But all of these kids are now in jail. Right? There, is a, there is an element of vengeance in this way, the, the system that Erdogan has, has created. And I think it ultimately is going to bite him back because I think Turkish society is one in which there is a sense of fairness. People instinctively know what is right and what is wrong. And Erdogan thinks by, because he controls the press and he can repeat, and everybody will repeat everything he says day after day, that he, but I think he's creating a counter reaction against him that is now not visible, but it's gonna come out. Because, as I said, I mean, it, 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 Turkish society does have a, a, a compass. It's not, it's not some, it, people are not uh, sheep, right? And um, we'll see. Um, one word about, because um, I feel a lot of, in one way, pain, or uh, I'm suffering for these really young boys you know, these young cadets you're talking about, you know, that was innocently sent out there. Look, the Turkish military, like all militaries, is quite hierarchical. And if your commanding officer tells you, if, especially if you're a private or a cadet, do this, they will do it unquestionably. Look, I heard the other day the story of a shepherd from Sivas, right, right in the middle of the country towards the east. This is a guy who had actually never left his tiny, tiny, tiny little village except to go and do his military service. And they gave him 16 years jail time. Now, like him, there are lots of other people, not just cadets and, and, and soldiers, but other individuals who have been uh, you know, accused. And once you get accused, you don't escape. It's like it's like under Beria, if you want, in in the in the Soviet Union. I mean, Beria would shoot them, but but nobody's being shot here at the moment. But once you're accused, that's it. You're guilty. And this is what I mean because 
every one of these unjustly jailed person for a long time has mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, cousins. So you, you can see that in society there will be a sense that why, am, why is this kid in jail? Why did we know he was not involved or he was just following orders? Why, why didn't, what I don't understand about Erdogan's reaction to the coup, why wasn't he more, magn shall we say, um, tolerant, or, I mean, not tolerant, but understand that he can't go after everybody, that there are people who are genuinely innocent. And he allowed them to be accused and, and you see in most of the indictments that the, the judiciary produces these days, there is nothing, absolutely nothing there. They're poorly written, they're made up, and um, which actually makes me uh, think the Turks say, well, we sent lots and lots of documentation to the Americans about Gulen proving that he was involved in the coup, proving that he was involved of all kinds of weird things in Turkey or illegal things. But if it is the, the kind of indictments you produce that you send to the Americans, the Americans are not going to take you seriously because there is no proof, there is no real accusation. I mean, you look, look at, I, I've been reading um, uh, indictments against some of these people who have recently been arrested in America on this uh, university cheating scandal. And I read an indictment. I also read Osman Kavala's indictment. It's a huge difference in terms of the way these indictments are written. I mean, there's a logic and proof in, in, the, in the American ones. Whereas the Osman Kavala one that I've seen is just made up of nothing. Right. If this is the kind of stuff they send to the United States, the Americans cannot ever um, extradite Gulen because no, no court in this country will take that seriously. The relationship between Gulen and Erdogan is, is fascinating in the sense that um, this was a deal, a, dev, a deal each made with the devil. Each needed the other one. Erdogan needed cadres because he didn't have cadres. He just, in, if you think about it, in 2002, 2003, when Erdogan came to power, he was a product of Nejmetin Erbakan's uh, religious party. Those people had really no background in governing. They, had, they were just ideologues. So Erdogan finds himself prime minister. In, in, in Turkey, and he needs cadres. So he went, basically, he, he went to Gulen. But philosophically, Erdogan is closer to the Muslim Brotherhood, and Gulen, and Gulen is this the Sufi tradition that comes from inside Turkey. But you see that Gulen also used his position in the government, I mean, or his people in the government, to do certain things that those investigations against uh, military officers, the famous Ergenekon and Balios, and to this day I don't really understand what happened. But the big break between Erdogan and Gulen actually happened over a policy issue. It was when Erdogan was attempting to start a peace process with, with the Kurds that Gulen really opposed. Gulen used to be, has always been very anti-Kurdish. I mean, today maybe he's say, he may be saying something different, but at the time, he really was unhappy that Erdogan was doing this. And he tried to stop it. He tried to go after Erdogan's intelligence chief, Hakan Fidan. That's where the real break started between the two. And that's when Erdogan, I mean, that's when Gulen thought Erdogan was going too far, and Erdogan must have thought the same thing about Gulen. And immediately after that, you see the leaks about the family and the corruption of the Erdogan family being exposed for everybody to hear, to listen, right? 
Uh, but the fundamental uh, breaking point was really over the, the issue of the Kurds. That's when they both realized that the other one was going too far. You, you, Erdogan's foreign policy is in the process of trying to show that it is independent of the United States, it's independent of the Western alliance, that he's really his own person. So you see this relationship develop with Putin. But what's interesting, of course, is that the Turks did shoot down a Russian aircraft. And in fact, I remember at the time, the Russian aircraft had crossed in, by mistake into Turkish territory and got shot down. And Davutoglu, Ahmed uh, Davutoglu was the prime minister then. And he actually went on television and said, I gave the order to shoot down. And if the Russians go in again, we will shoot them down, we will shoot them down again. And what happened? The Russians immediately imposed sanctions on Turkey. They stopped trade, Turkish imports into, into Russia. They started making all kinds of, of noise and you saw the Turks backtrack. And then suddenly, some genius in Turkey decided, oh, we should blame Gülenis pilots for, for the shoot down. We, we didn't shoot it down, it was Gülenis pilots. I mean, as if anybody, certainly Putin did not believe, but this was their way of saying to apologize. And it's interesting because it should show the Americans that if, if you stand up to the Turks, they actually back down. In fact, the United States does have one such experience. Um, when the Turks arrested Andrew Brunson, this pastor, and accused him of spying, and they kept him in prison for two years. And there were negotiations to, to, to have him released, and those failed. And because Andrew Brunson was an evangelist, and there is a very strong evangelist lobby in this country that is very powerful in the Republican Party, they got to Trump. And Trump, who changes his mind every day, that day he got very upset at this and said, you know, and had a real outburst against Turkey. And what happened to the Turkish lira? It fell dramatically, upsetting Turkish markets, really creating an economic crisis for the Turks. And what happened after that? Andrew Brunson was released. And as was actually a foreign service national that they had arrested a few months later, um, the, the Turks had arrested three American State Department, the Turkish employees of the American State Department. And one of them was released a few months after Brunson, but the other two are still, uh, yeah. But so if, if, you, if you take a stand against the Turks, they back down. I mean, Turkey may be a, a very important country, it's a big economy, it's an important country, and it has a great future. But that doesn't mean that it can, it can stand up to, to the superpowers. And we saw it both with the shutdown and with the Andrew Brunson case, if you push back. But the United States today has a, a president who's very unpredictable. So trying to figure out Turkish-American relations is very difficult. I mean, I'll give you the most famous example is that in a phone conversation with Erdogan, I, I don't know what Erdogan told Trump, but Trump said, okay, I'm out of Syria, I'm done, it's all yours. He did it without checking with his National Security Council. He did it without checking with the military. I mean, he just did it on the spot, spur of the moment. So when you think about the S-400s, Trump may decide to give them a waiver. At a certain point, if the right, he has the right conversation with Erdogan. So we are, I mean, in the United States especially, um, we, have, we don't have a foreign policy. Ironically, it's a little bit like Turkey. I mean, we have a president who, who makes certain decisions on the spur of the moment or pushes. Yes, sure, he has certain ideas about trade with China, that the bureaucracy is behind. Um, uh, so there are certain issues of which there is coordination between the White House and the rest of the bureaucracy. But on a lot of things, 
he is on his own. So it's very difficult to, to kind of predict how Turkish American relations will develop in the next two years as, under Trump. Right, because we've seen vagaries that are difficult to explain otherwise. But Henry, here I think we're touching upon a very crucial question, and that is uh, the last couple of years. Okay, you had this uh, situation with Brunson, where it was a reaction, and then he stepped down and, uh, and uh, released him. But why is NATO, European countries, US, why are they not reacting harder on a lot of issues when it comes to human rights, freedom of speech, imprisonment of hundreds of thousands of people, uh, and so on and so on. Because the reaction from the West is, is almost like nothing. The Turks have succeeded when you look at the relationship between the West and Turkey as, uh, in general. The Turks have succeeded in essentially bullying the West on certain issues. Well, there is one big, very, very big issue here, and that is the three million refugees, Syrian refugees that are in Turkey. And Erdogan keeps using that as a card. And that terrifies Europe. I don't think that he can actually push those refugees towards, towards Europe because it's become very, very difficult to cross the Aegean. It's very difficult to cross the border. So it, there's a way in which that card is not um, very effective anymore. But Europeans are still quite afraid, afraid of that. And given what's going on in Europe in terms of domestic politics, the rise of populist parties, the rise of the right wing, nobody wants to take a chance. Right? Now, the United States doesn't push on human rights because we have a president who, who doesn't care about human rights. And he says it openly. He says absolutely openly. He not, doesn't hide it. So we haven't really criticized. We, we actually issued a statement on Osman Kavala the other day. It was okay, but I don't think the Turks took it seriously and they will not take it seriously. The Europeans can do a lot more. I mean, it's clear that the Europeans have given up on Turkey in terms of accession. Accession is never going to happen. Uh, they can't say it in polite company, right? Um, so, and they've also, I think, given up on their ability to influence Erdogan. So, if they criticize Turkish policy on journalists, on human rights, on on all these imprisonments, on Osman Kavala, Erdogan is going to ignore them. And what are they going to do? Right? By contrast, the trade relationship between Turkey and, its, and, and Europe is actually quite involved. Right? The, despite both economic problems and all these uh, violations of human rights, Europe is still continuing to invest in, in, in Turkey because there's a, a hard-working labor force, it's cheaper, it's a big market. Right. It's also, um, you know, a, it can be, you, you can use it to export to other, other places. So, Europe is in a way caught. Um, and I think in some countries in Europe, probably in Germany, um, the Germans are also probably wary of their own Turkish German population. I mean, yes, there is a significant segment of that population who is anti-Erdogan, but I think the majority is probably still with Erdogan. And um, I think they, they worry about antagonizing and creating more trouble for themselves. So there are many, many, many factors. And in some ways, I think they've also decided anything we say will be completely ignored, so why bother? Yeah, they're really swallowing a lot of um, things here. I mean, Erdogan is several times called uh, Angela Merkel uh, Nazi. He's calling the, the Prime Minister of Netherlands several times Nazi, uh, fascist, and whatever. I mean, he's using a lot of bad words for the, for the European leaders. And they don't say anything. And the next fact, time they meet, they're standing beside each other and smiling. I find it sort of... 
Uh, and in fact, when you, look, when you look at the European-Turkish relationship, I mean, what really did shock me is the fact that Europeans did not react when Erdogan called them Nazi remnants to the Germans and to the Dutch. The fact that they didn't call him on the carpet and, you know, at the very least, kick out the Turkish ambassador or bring back your own ambassador for consultations. I mean, show some displeasure. I mean, the Europeans are proving that they're not... I mean, as I said, in a way, the Europeans, you can say that they're really insulting the Turks and the, the, the Turks don't get it, is that they say, you're not important. I mean, this is not important enough for us to get upset about. You, you can say whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, but you're not really that significant. I mean, it's like they don't, they don't call on Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan every day. They don't have the same relationship. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, but, 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 um, but I think the Europeans did, did themselves a great deal of disservice by not reacting strongly to the Nazi remnant comments. Because this is a question of um, you're insulting a government, a people, uh, and on a very sensitive subject, the probably the most sensitive subject in, in European politics. And um, the message you're basically sending is you can do whatever you want with us and we'll just continue. I'm trying to follow a sort of um, uh, touching upon a situation here that what is it with people that wants this strong man to govern? There's still a massive percentage of people that is uh, supporting these guys. You know, you can see it in several countries like Chile, Iran, Serbia, <laughs> Turkey, you see it in Hungary, you see it in Poland. People are backing up. What is this desire uh, for this strong man or, 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 the, or, or the logic of the tyrant that is making him coming into power in such a... It, it, why, why, why is this happening, you know? How come that it is happening? Why are not the people stronger in defense of democracy? Erdogan, I think, is just the tip of a larger wave, if you want, of populist leaders who are fundamentally anti-democratic, who basically use not the rule of law, not the legal system, but essentially charismatic authority to establish control over, um, over people. But I think you see it with Viktor Orban, you see it now with all these right-wing parties that are emerging. But I think th this is, it's part of the same, same phenomenon. But I think in the case of Erdogan, the, gen the, the trajectory is different. In Europe and elsewhere, I think it's mostly a reaction to politics, um, or at least the way politics was, was conducted. The, 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 what people perceive to be Europe, European unions kind of undemocratic or very bureaucratic or very distant um, way of taking decisions, policies. It's a huge organization and you don't feel it at the local level. There's been a, this kind of a break between the individual in a small town in northern Italy and, and Brussels. But Turkey is different from that perspective. Erdogan is not a reaction necessarily to that. I mean, Erdogan became, has, is on the way of becoming a tyrant or a strongman after he had been a Democrat. 
because in his first incarnation after he won power in 2002-2003, this is a guy who basically opened the prison, who basically freed society. I mean, all liberals in Europe, including myself, you know, thought this guy is a real thing. That he was actually, finally we had, there was a leader in Turkey who was going to have a soft landing in the relationship between religion and politics, but at the same time allows civil society to, to blossom. And, and you look at what Europe's reaction was to Erdogan, they opened the doors to him. Right? Accession negotiations moved very, very fast. Maybe there would still not be accession, but at least everybody thought Erdogan was the best thing that could have happened to Turkey. And it is after that that he becomes... So Erdogan's populism now, Erdogan's uh, strongman behavior is not in reaction to what happened before Erdogan came to power. You know, he was not, he was a Democrat, or at least he pretended to be a Democrat. Uh, he fooled everybody, clearly, or he himself changed, or when, once he realized he could be, you know, he could be the leader unchallenged leader and build all these palaces for himself and you see that, that there is something a, a desire for grandeur I mean he wants to be more than he is and you see it not just in terms of the policies that he uh, he follows in terms of foreign policy he wants you know he really does want to um, become the leader of the Middle East become I mean he he, he always talks about one of these big things is that the world is bigger than five, i.e. meaning the world is bigger than the five permanent members of the uh, UN Security Council, that somehow Turkey should become also a member of the um, permanent, should become a permanent member because Turkey deserves to be there. I mean, but he has this granite, but you also see it in the decor of his palaces. All these Louis XIV type gold, chairs and gold uh, furniture, where is this coming from? This is a guy who came from Kasım Pasha, one of the poorer districts of Istanbul, right? Um, so did he change in the process? Did he, did power get to his head? He realized that he could do whatever he wanted and he seen. But that's not Viktor Orban. This is not um, the Italian populists who are in power now, uh, or any of the others who are emerging in the other countries. Those are a reaction to whether it's immigration or it's um, Brussels. Right? There is a wave that maybe will, will reverse itself down the road. So you say in a way that uh, Adon is basically just interested in power and more power. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, look, he's competing, first of all, with Ataturk. Right? That's his first... I mean, he's going to... He wants, essentially, to be the real Ataturk of Turkey. Right? The same way, you know, we, when you grow up in Turkey, uh, there is this deification of Ataturk. Ataturk was this incredible guy who, who, who did no wrong who was, um, you know, you, children used to be taught that you first love God, then Ataturk, then your, your parents, right? That was the hierarchy in, 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 in primary school. So this, this deification of Ataturk, I think he's trying to replace that. He wants to people to deify him the same way they deify Ataturk and forget Ataturk. And to some extent, if you think of new generations, they will all know only Erdogan. And you don't have the same emphasis on Ataturk as you had before. And with the, also with the institutional changes he's making, whether it is the new religious schools that are being set up, look at the amount of money the Dianet, the religious authority, is getting when they're cutting budgets elsewhere. The Dianet budget is increasing. So there is an emphasis away from A, what Ataturk pushed for. Whether he was right or wrong, I'm not, dis I'm not questioning him. I think Ataturk made huge mistakes. But, um, but um, 
so he's, he's, it's more than power that he's searching for. He wants a place in history for himself in Turkey and beyond Turkey. Right. And when it comes to Turkey, I think he has achieved it quite a bit. I mean, another five years of Erdogan um, rule, I think you have essentially, look, Erdogan came to power in 2002, 2003. Um, we're in 2019, so you have already uh, 16 years. All right. So there's one generation that has gone knowing nothing but Erdogan. And I would argue another five years. And he intends to stay until 2033 anyway. So there will be two, three generations that will only know him. And that's what he wants. Do you think also there is a... Um, I mean, if, he's, if he stops in a way, you know, if he's stepping down, he knows that he has done so many bad things uh, when it comes to corruption, imprisonment, torture, and so on and so on, that uh, if he steps on, he will end up in jail. So he has to. It's a logic there that he has to sort of increase his power all the time too. I don't think Erdogan is afraid that if he steps down that he's going to go to jail because I don't think Erdogan ever thinks of stepping down. I mean, Ed, there's one thing about Erdogan, which, I mean, look, this guy is one of the best politicians. I mean, he's now making a lot more mistakes than he did before. But if you look at his, his rise to power, you have to give him credit. This is a guy who came out of nowhere, right, and transformed Turkey. It's no mean feat. And look at where he came from. He came from essentially a religious party, Nejmet in Erbakan's party, which is, was made of real pe people who were, as the French would say, illettré, who, you know, could not read and write, essentially. Right? And... I sometimes say that Erdogan doesn't have a brain, he has a supercomputer in, his, in here, right? Because he is capable of keeping track of the most minute detail on a, whatever, in a small town in, in Konya, he knows probably who the mayor is, right? He has an incredible political acumen that a lot of politicians don't have. And as a result, um, he, for, he can, he can he, rule Turkey for a long time to come. The danger for Turkey is that in the process, he has now destroyed ins all the institutions. You don't have a judiciary anymore. He's destroying the educational system, right? Um, the military, right? So parliament is not, a parliament anymore. What happens with the day, like everybody, with the day he disappears? That's the most dangerous point for Turkey. Because the, the supercomputer can keep tabs on all these things and make mistakes and he'll figure out how to fix the mistakes. But because he's destroyed institutions, because he relies solely on charismatic authority to, to govern, I think Turkey is going to have a incredible crisis the day Erdogan disappears. Because there's nothing that holds underneath. The other thing Erdogan has done is that he's also destroying civil society. Right? He's deliberately going after civil society because he sees civil society as the most important threat against him. I think he really got a scare with the Gizi protests. He saw mobilization, significant mobilization, by a part of the population he has never, never trusted, right? uh, the kind of the liberal young um, uh, uh, folks. And he wants to make sure that this never happens again. And you, you see it with, about his reaction to just about everything. Recently there was um, demonstrations in, in downtown Istanbul by women and the police suppressed it quite, quite violently. They suppress every attempt at civil society um, or organization that is not controlled by them. 
right? And when you look at the Osman Kabbalah case, and Osman has been in jail as today, 501 days, um, that's an emblematic prosecution. It is to show Turkey that you don't, even if he was not an organizer of Gezi, which is that what the indictment on him is all about, um, is to show that you don't rise up against that one. Right? This is a message he's, he's sending. And, and it is brutal. And he's essentially taking a, a, somebody who has always tried to do good and putting him in really terrible jail conditions. And it took them, you know, Osman was put in jail and it took them f f more than 460 days to come up with, a, with an indictment. Usually, you send somebody to jail if you have an indictment. Right? They didn't have an indictment. They just made it up as they went along. Right? They first accu accused Osman of, of, the, of being part of the coup, but if you look at the indictment, there's no mention of that. It's all about Gezi. And because Gezi was, the Gezi protest in 2013, were something Erdogan realized he could not control. Right? And think about it also from another perspective. Gezi took place two years after the Arab Spring, right? And the Arab Spring was a genuine popular protest that brought down, I mean, a lot of governments did not mean necessarily democracy, but it brought down governments, right? And I think Erdogan conflated the two, that this can be another Arab Spring or Turkish Spring, if you want. But in, if you allow people to organize and demonstrate. And that's why he's going after civil society. And there will be no civil society after, uh, you know, when he's done. There is no press today. Every single news channel, every single newspaper essentially parrots what he's saying. He allows one or two newspapers that are supposed to show that he, there is some diversity, but those newspapers are A, afraid, two, they tend to be exceedingly nationalist and don't really veer far from the official Turkish line on many issues, especially foreign policy, and issue of the Kurds, of course. And, um, but, but his goal is to have an obedient civil society, the same way the sultans had an obedient society. Right? And that's his goal. And Osman, unfortunately, uh, is going to suffer for a long time because I don't want to make a point. Even at one point, at the very beginning, Osman Kavala was accused of being part of the coup. And the only reason they did that was because three days after the coup, I went to a restaurant in Istanbul and I bumped into Os to Osman Kavala, who was having dinner with somebody else. I was going to have dinner with a friend and we talked for a few minutes, standing up, and then when the police decided to go after me and see all the places I went to, they found, they saw us on, on video camera that we were talking. That's the basis on which they accused Osman at the beginning that he was part, part of the coup. Uh, so clearly any association with me is, to, to a large extent, dangerous. So I, 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 I keep away. In academic circles here, in think tank circles here, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean the pro-Turkish think tanks won't invite me. That's fine. Um, I, I mean, I have a certain reputation in this country and in Europe that, you know, uh, but there are, I mean, the, the, there was one case where the, a British institution, I won't name, name it, um, very distinguished British institution had a, lit, they do these retreats uh, on different countries, different issues, and they did one on Turkey and they invited me. And they usually bring people from, if you do it on Turkey, you bring people from Turkey. If you do it on, on, on Finland, you'll bring people from Finland. The Turks apparently objected and they said, if I were to show up, that they would not send people.
right? And it put the institution in a very difficult situation. And they came to me and they explained the situation and I basically said, you invited me, I'm coming, you can disinvite me. As a matter of principle, I'm not gonna pull out. And they, to their credit, they told the Turks, no, we're not disinviting Ali Baki. But you see how um, um, it's the, a the government tries to interfere, but also you you see it in terms of you know people avoiding me. That's fine. I, I don't need that. I have my own. I have my career. I've reached a certain stage in my career that this is insignificant. I mean, it's sad for me that I have had a lot of, I have a lot of friends in Turkey. What is sadder for me is that I can't go back to Istanbul. I can't go back to Turkey. I mean, I love the place. I have very strong connections uh, with that place. I've been born there. Um, my family was, has been there since Inquisition. So, you know, this is part of me and I can't go back. To me, that's the greatest, shall we say, drawback or cost of, of this nonsense. You have been researching the Middle East uh, your whole life. Do you think he has a chance to become this new sultan of this area, of the, of the Islamic world in a way? Erdogan has huge ambitions for himself, for Turkey. And you see that reflected not only on, in his own discourse, but the way the, the, the pro Erdogan, the, the Turkish press, it's all pro Erdogan, basically talk about him. They do constantly talk about the fact that he is the leader of the Middle East. He is the leader, he's on the way of becoming the leader, leader of the Muslims, not just the Middle East, all Muslims. And Erdogan does have huge ambitions in that sense. And, you know, it is A, to eclipse Atatürk at one hand, but he wants to form, create um, he wants people to talk about him, he wants people to really see him as a leader. But whether or not he's going to be successful um, remains um, a big question. Look, Arabs don't like others to take the lead for them, right? Uh, Turks are not Arabs, there's a certain history there, and you see that um, both the Saudis and the Egyptians are pushing very hard uh, against Erdogan, right? Um, Erdogan's star in the Arab world actually really reached a very high point in 2009 when he had this um, at Davos, this thing, this confrontation with Shimon Peres, and his theatrics then suddenly um, created an image of, for him in the Arab world um, that was very positive, you know. But that has dissipated, and um, in the Arab world that has gone, even unsuccessfully through the Arab Spring can see and appreciate or understand what's going on in Turkey. And why should they let somebody else become their leader, right? And this is a way, I think it's also a reflection of the way the Turks look at the Arabs. They have always thought of the Arabs as being less than themselves, right? They have, they have a certain um, attitude towards, towards, towards the Arabs. And, and the Arabs know that, and the Arabs are not going to accept the leadership of anybody. There can always be tactical relationships. Today, you look at Qatar and Turkey. Right? They have a very strong relationship because the Turks have come in and supported Qatar against the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia. There's a Turkish base in Qatar. And by the way, you also see that the Turks are now putting soldiers in Somalia, in Qatar. I mean, trying to create, if you want, as, as if there is a 
Turkish zone in, in the region by putting military bases. But I don't think that's going to hold. And I don't think the Turks, that Erdogan is going to, um, to succeed. And um, he could have maybe done it in 2009, but it's too late now.